Hello everybody and welcome back to another Civi 398 assignment guide. So in this assignment guide we're going to be covering assignment number eight, question number four, which is the last question of assignment number eight, which is great for us. Almost done guys and again hopefully this assignment wasn't too bad, should have been nice and easy. However question number four has a little bit of a trick to it, but once you guys know the trick it's going to be easy just like the other questions. So it says consider the Hognestad material model for concrete in compression that follows the following nonlinear relationship between the uniaxial stress sigma 1 1 and the uniaxial strain epsilon 1 1. So we're given a nice formula and right away we can tell that this is not going to be a linear formula. Now one thing that might be a little confusing for you guys is we know that it's a relationship between stress and strain. So sigma 1 1 epsilon 1 1. However in this formula we have two extra parameters which are that f prime c as well as that epsilon naught. So in this case, F prime C is actually the peak compressive strength of the concrete, and epsilon naught is the strain corresponding to this peak compressive stress. So if I were to go to the lab, take a concrete cylinder and crush it, we can see that the stress is going to go all the way up until it peaks. So at this peak, the corresponding stress is F prime C, and the strain at F prime C is epsilon naught. Now it says if the peak compressive stress of the concrete is 22 MPa, which occurs at a strain of 0.002. So in this case, 22 MPa is our F prime C and 0.002, that's epsilon naught. And it says the concrete crushes at a strain of 0.0035. And it wants us to determine four, sorry, five different things. Now, it may ask for five different things, but as you guys are going to see, three of these things are basically child's play. It's not going to be a problem at all. So part A says plot the relationship between the compressive stress and strain if the concrete crushes when the strain reaches a value of 0.0035. Well, this is a piece of cake because we have a nice equation that relates the stress and the strain. All you guys are going to have to do is plot that equation from epsilon is equal to 0 to epsilon is equal to 0.0035, which is when that concrete crushes. So part A, piece of cake, just plot the equation. Now part B is where it gets a little bit weird. It says find the strain energy stored when the concrete reaches peak load. So again, that's what we're doing in assignment eight in general. We're gonna be finding that strain energy stored or that strain energy density. Part C is basically the same thing where it says determine the total strain energy dissipated when the concrete fails by crushing. So it's actually going to be the exact same procedure as part B and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But if we move into part D it says determine the compressive stress at which the concrete fails by crushing. Well it's easy because we have a nice formula relating stresses to strains. All we have to do is substitute that failing strain into the formula. It'll tell us our failing compressive stress. And finally, part E says, find the ratio between the compressive stress at which the concrete fails by crushing and the peak compressive stress. All you guys are going to have to do, take your answer from part D and divide it by that peak compressive stress, nice and easy. So what this question basically comes down to in terms of new material or material that's uh, not really obvious is going to be parts B and C. We're basically finding that strain energy at two different values of strain. Part B is going to be when the strain is equal to 0.002, while part C will be the strain at 0.0035. Now one thing I always ask in the seminars, and I kind of want to reiterate this again, is the thing that will throw students off is the wording. So part B says strain energy stored, while part C says strain energy dissipated. And the reason why we have to distinct the two is because at peak load, the cylinder, that concrete cylinder that we have, or a concrete beam, whatever kind of concrete structure you guys want to think of, it doesn't break yet. That's why we say the strain energy is stored. It's because there is currently a lot of stress in there, but it hasn't broke yet. Now, when you talk about dissipated, it means released. So of course, when concrete crushes, it breaks, it falls apart, all that energy that it once stored has been released. So even though part B and part C had different wordings, we're still doing the exact same procedure to find that strain energy. However, since in part C, the concrete has broken, we cannot say that that strain energy is stored no longer. It is dissipated, it is released in the forms of damage, as well as sounds, something like that. So here comes the problem with this, is we're dealing with a nonlinear material. However, in the first three previous questions, we were dealing with the linear material. So when we had that nice linear material, we had a nice relationship for our strain energy density, where u bar is equal to one half 
multiplied by sigma 1, 1 times epsilon 1, 1 plus, etc., etc., etc. And this actually would have been really nice because since we're dealing with a uniaxial material, the only non zero component is that uniaxial stress. So sigma 1, 1 in this case is our only non zero stress. Therefore, this formula simplifies actually quite nicely into u bar is equal to 1 half sigma 1, 1 times epsilon 1, 1. And we can actually simplify this further because we have an expression for sigma 1, 1. So all we had to do is substitute our sigma 1, 1 in terms of epsilon 1, 1. We get the nice following equation. And if we look at this equation, it's great because the strain energy is basically in terms of three parameters. We have f prime c, which we know. We have epsilon naught, which we know, and then we have that epsilon 1, 1. So for part B, all we have to do is say epsilon 1, 1 is equal to 0 0.002. For part C, all we had to do is say epsilon 1, 1 is equal to 0 0.0035, and then we'd have our strain energy. So we say, all right, so since we know all these parameters, our strain energy is basically just plug and chug. Well, actually, no. Please don't do this. This procedure would be completely correct if it was for question one, two, or three. However, this is not the correct procedure for question number four, and the reason why is we have a nonlinear material. Now, it's hard to visualize what this means, so I, what I did is I want to show you guys the behavior of these two materials. So if we have a linear behavior, a nice stress-strain curve, a linear material, of course, goes up linearly. That's why we call it a linear material, because there's a nice linear relationship between the stress and the strain. Now, for concrete, though, or any other nonlinear behaviors, it's not linear. So it doesn't always have to be parabolic, but in the case of concrete, it is. So when, what you guys will find in part A, when you guys plot the stress-strain curve, you guys should get something exactly like this, where it's more of a parabolic shape. Now, it doesn't matter if the material is linear or nonlinear. The way that we calculate the strain energy density is always the same. It's going to be the area under that curve. So for a linear material, it's going to be the shaded blue underneath that linear curve. And for a nonlinear material, it's going to be the shaded blue underneath that parabolic curve. So the way is going to be the exact same. If we were to look at a linear material, well, it's very easy to find that area. It's simply going to be 1 half because it's a triangle multiplied by sigma 1, 1 times epsilon 1, 1. And as you guys will know, this is exactly what we had on the previous slides. So for those of you guys always wondering where that one half comes from, it's because in a linear material, we deal with a triangle. Of course, the area of a triangle is going to be one half base times height. So that's where the one half comes from. However, in a nonlinear material, it gets a little bit more confusing because it really depends on the curve type. It's not as simple as saying, OK, well, we're always going to have the same thing. So therefore, we can have a nice relationship. No, because again, even though this is a nice parabolic shape, it doesn't have to be parabolic to be nonlinear. It just has to be not linear. So how do we deal with these type of problems? Well, what we actually have to do is integrate. And it makes sense because if we're dealing with the area under the curve, that's basically the definition of integration. So for part B and part C in this question, we're going to be using that integration where we integrate from zero to the strain in which we want of our sigma 1, 1 function. So if we look at this function, we know what sigma 1, 1 is, and all we have to do is integrate that with respect to epsilon 1, 1. The only thing that's going to change between part B and part C is how far we integrate. So in part B, if we're concerned with that peak strain, we're integrating from 0 to 0 0.002. For part C, where we're interested in the crushing strain, we're going to integrate from 0 to 0 0.0035. So as you guys are going to be using Mathematica, it's very easily very easy to integrate this function and that's going to be the only real tricky part so this is it for question number four again should be a nice easy question once you realize it's nonlinear. if you guys use it as a linear function you guys will get the wrong answer and then you guys will be <laughs> messaging me wondering what's going on so hopefully this uh, puts all your questions to bed but one last thing I want to touch on is a little fun fact, and it's why is energy important in design? So most of you guys now have taken a design class or two, whether it be 374 or 474. And what you guys have found is you never use energy in design. Never. If I'm designing steel, well, I'm concerned with that yield stress. If I'm designing concrete, I'm concerned with that F prime C or that peak compressive stress. We never really use energy. For design, it's always when we come to typical loads, we design for strength and we design for serviceability. Energy is never really considered. 
So the question becomes, why is this important? Because again, we're dealing with a class that a lot of you guys will agree, it's a pretty abstract class. So does this class actually matter in civil engineering? Well, yes, it does. Because one of the most important design features when we're dealing with buildings is actually seismic design. So this would be the design of a building in an earthquake region. Now, very luckily for us in Edmonton, we don't really deal with earthquakes. If there was an earthquake in Edmonton, though, I would be running out of every building because it's all coming down, basically. Seismic design is very hard because unlike typical loads, we can have a good estimation of what those loads are. An earthquake, we have no idea. An earthquake can be completely random, something like that. However, the one thing that we do know about earthquakes is the loads are huge. So if I had a building and I subjected it to an earthquake, the shear in that building would be around 3,000 kilonewtons. This would be the shear at the base of the building. Now, you guys may not have a perspective because who knows? You guys may have not taken a design class. Normal shears in a building, maybe 200, maybe 300 if you guys are going a little bit extreme. So as you guys can see, 3,000, that's ridiculously high. Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys, and this will scare a lot of people. When we design buildings for earthquakes, and again, this is why you guys should be lucky. You guys are in Edmonton right now and don't have to deal with this. But when we design buildings for earthquakes, we can't design for 3,000 kilonewtons. It'd be way too expensive, and the building would be way too beefy. We're not creating a building in that case. We'd be creating a bunker. Our walls would be one meter thick, just a giant, gross-looking building. So what we do is we use the ductility of the building, or basically how much energy can this building dissipate? So rather in terms of defining the earthquake as a strength, we define the earthquake as an energy. And what we can do is say, all right, well, my wall, or let's say my shear wall, or my beam, or my column, it can dissipate this much energy. And what we can do is we can lower those design loads based on the ductility of a building. So as you guys will see, if you guys don't go into structural capstone, you're going to have to design for an earthquake. And what we do is we take that base shear of an earthquake, which is 3,000, and we divide it by two numbers. The first one being RD and RO. Now, RD, this is the important one because this is based on the energy dissipation of the building. So if I find that my building can dissipate a lot of energy, I will have a higher RD factor. And notice how we're dividing by RD. So even though my building puts three, sorry, my earthquake loads my building up to 3,000 kilonewtons in my design, I'm saying, all right, well, I'm not doing 3,000 kilonewtons because my building is very ductile. Therefore, I'm dividing that 3,000 kilonewtons by three. Now, there's another factor called RO. I'm not going to get into that. It's a little bit different. But basically, as we can see, energy and design comes down to this. It'll impact our ductility factors, and our ductility factors are going to decrease our earthquake loads. So again, if the earthquake's putting 3,000 kilonewtons on my building, thanks to the ductility or the energy dissipation of the building, I can lower that to about 770 kilonewtons, which is substantial. But again, you're, you're kind of playing with fire here where... You're designing something that if an earthquake were to hit, it's going to be taking a lot of damage. It won't be uh, ready for use right after the earthquake. But again, the main goal of earthquake design isn't to have a building fully functional after the earthquake. It's just to make sure that a building survives the earthquake and doesn't kill people. That's the main goal of structural engineering. We don't want to kill people. <laughs> so if you guys stayed around for the fun fact, thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for everything in assignment number eight. It should be nice and done now. And again, hopefully it should be nice and easy for you guys. So again, thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in assignment number nine.